it became obvious not too long after I posted my 90-ish minute roll and ramble about Linux being dead, or being a dead end at least, that I probably should have clarified a few things a little better. And yeah, it, it was a pretty long ramble bit about, uh, about software and one particular thing about software and a whole lot of chit chat about File Explorer and Windows and a whole lot of people missed the point somehow. Um, there was one particular set of comments that, um, yeah, they, uh, they didn't exactly seem to get it. Um, because when I was talking about File Explorer and I was talking about how I can sort video files by attributes inside the file, by bitrate and such, um, somehow someone said, oh, you can use, you, you can, sorting by file type is something that any file manager can do on Linux. And it was like, well, wait a minute, that's not what I said. Where did you get that? And uh, someone else said, try using this program to sift through video files on Linux. And the whole point, the whole point was that I don't want to use separate programs to do file operations. I want my file manager to manage my files. I shouldn't have to go into a bunch of different specialty programs to be able to sort a set of video files by you know, in common formats by commonly well-known attributes of said video files. I, I should not have to do that, period. And that's the problem. I shouldn't have to go to something else to do what I should be able to do in a particular program. A lot of people said that Adobe or um, DaVinci Resolve seems to have gotten a specific level of hate from people in the past few that I've posted. Um, their, apparently their file browser is notoriously crappy. And I, I don't know, I don't use it. I've been meaning to use Resolve, but I, I haven't had to use it for file browsing. So I don't know what to say to that. I do know that Adobe's media browser is not the greatest, but it does allow you to just use Windows File Explorer file pickers. So, you know, that's the thing is, if if you have a file manager, and that's the thing that the other programs use to go dig up files, the disadvantage of that is that the programs don't have their own custom role, your own file manager solution to go dig up files. The advantage of that is that if the file manager does things right, then all of the benefits of what the file manager can do roll down to every other program in the entire system. And the problem with all of the open source operating systems is that they have crap, either they have crap file manager programs that don't do a lot of things that Windows File Explorer does, or if they have a file manager, even if they had the best file manager in the world, 80% of the software would not use the file manager, but instead would use their own file picker that's either the default one provided by the toolkit or, more likely, some stupid roll-your-own solution. Like, GIMP has its own file picker, which it, it just, it's not great either. And I don't know, man. It's amazing to me that people did not understand some of the things that I was trying to say because I thought I was a lot clearer than that. But sometimes I think the problem is that people don't listen rather than me not saying the right thing. Can't cover all bases. Everybody has a different perception and their perception is molded by what they want to hear instead of actually hearing the words that I say. They hear a few words or they read a title that says Linux is a dead end or Linux is not the future. And they immediately go, <laughs> that's not true, Linux is everything, hang, 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 better than Bill Gates, without listening to any of the arguments. So I can't help you people. If that's the way you are, I can't help you. I'm sorry. There's just, there's no way for me to save the world, and there's definitely no way for me to get people who won't listen to listen. So for all of you who do listen, I appreciate it. But anyway, going back to that discussion, I, I spent way more time than I probably should have discussing that one aspect that was a problem in basically every open source system today 
um, other than Q QNX and BSD. And the whole point of that was to illustrate that this is just one thing, one decision that was made about Linux in particular in the mid 90s. So we're talking almost 30 years ago as of this recording, almost a 30 year old decision that has had effects downstream ever since it was made. This decision, this one decision, has made it so that the effort of finding the length of the name of a file returned in a directory read call, that that effort has to be duplicated for every single one that you need the name length for, uh, even though that work's already been done. It's just supposed to be a deep dive into one item that could be improved and could have been done right back then, but because of that one bad choice based on Torvald's sensibilities of the day, which may, I, I want to make it clear, I do not blame him for making the wrong choice. In 1995, he was a much younger man and a more inexperienced programmer. Linux was originally a hobby for him to plunk in around in 1991 to, to squeeze all the features out of his 386. So I can't say that I'm terribly surprised. Um, it, you know, that means he only had three or four years worth of solid operating system coding experience. And, and can you really blame the guy for making the wrong choice? But that wrong choice had knock-on effects <clears throat> that now, because that was not available, every piece of software, every single one that is built on top of Linux, the kernel, is affected by it. The C library is affected by it. What the C library returns to applications is affected by it. Applications not being able to get that information, well, that's affected by it too. If he had made a different choice, a whole lot of CPU cycles would have been saved. God knows how many watts of power dissipation would have been saved over the decades had Torvalds made the right choice in 1995. That's why I picked that. That was to illustrate the concept of technical debt and what it's like when you make one mistake. One mistake in 95, we could have back then done the right thing. All of the structure layout stuff would have been a certain way. And then because we had done the right thing at that point in time, everything that cascades from it would have cascaded from it naturally. But what we have now has cascaded from it artificially. Um, I shouldn't say artificially, it has cascaded naturally from the wrong decision. Therefore, all of the software is written with the assumption, implicit, explicit, whatever, that that wrong decision is the one that has been made and that is established and that permeates all the systems. So because this one wrong decision is the way that it has been for decades. That means decades worth of software. And remember, your operating system is worth absolutely nothing if you don't have a few killer apps that are needed to run on top of it. If your OS doesn't run the software that the user needs, your OS does not matter. Ask gamers who want to play games but get held back on Windows for one or two or 10 games because those games don't work on Linux, even with Wine and all that other good stuff. If you want to know about, about an application holding you back, gamers have no problem running their mouth about it. And boy, oh boy, you talk about a vocal crowd, and, and it's justified. Gamers are one market of people who run specific kinds of applications, and those applications they have to run on top of the system they were designed for or something that almost perfectly simulates or compatibility maps everything to that. So yeah, gaming is great because it, it susses stuff like this out. Gaming has always driven innovation, but it's not just gaming. Like niche specific software is always written for Windows. But anyway, that's getting a little off topic. Uh, what I was trying to hammer home is that technical debt from a long time ago causes software bases to be built around that debt. To, to we call the um, the accumulation of these of of this established stuff that is the wrong way. 
we call those accumulations interest on the technical debt. And the interest must be paid. Now, for the interest to be paid, someone has to do the hard work. What is the hard work when it comes to technical debt? That is, you find the thing that's wrong, find everything that's affected, fix the thing that's wrong, and fix everything that's affected by it. Now, the absolute minimum for the one thing, the one feature that I was talking about, that, that could, the, the one misfeature that could be fixed, the absolute minimum is rewrite parts of the kernel to return something different, rewrite that portion of the C library to return something different and fix the headers, um, offer up a compatibility shim, which means you have to write a compatibility shim that detects that whatever program wasn't built with the new feature and maps things accordingly, which, by the way, could mean slowing down the program. And then, once it's established in the kernel and the C library and you've ensured that the C library isn't going to cause like old programs, you know, stuff that was built before it to stop working all of a sudden, then you can start modifying applications to take advantage of the new benefit. Uh, the fix, or in this case, the significant speed increase, you can change your applications to take advantage of it, which means every application has to be changed to take advantage of it. It's a lot of work. You need to understand kernel programming. You need to understand C library programming, which is not the same as writing a hello world or writing a simple network socket sender receiver application. It, it's nowhere near that simple because a C library has literally tens of thousands of pieces of software, potentially millions of different code units compiled against it. So if you want to propose changes to it, they better be done damn right. Not just right, but damn right. All that is just to add one number to the way one function works. One, one kind of function, that's it. The read directory and all its family of calls, that, that's just to get, that, that, that's just one function. Now imagine if you found other issues like this, other potential speed increases like this in other areas you'd have to do the same thing, or worse. Because everything under the hood that gets passed around that looks one way that you change to look the other way has to also be changed to speak the other language. So technical debt expands over time, and I, I mean, I could potentially go in there, make the changes, propose the changes, um, but it could be months of programming and testing effort on my part, and chances are pretty good that nobody will accept it. I mean, we're talking about something that breaks the interface, the contract between the program and the library, the library and the kernel. You know, and that's the, that's the issue with technical debt, is that who's gonna fix it now? The problem is that an existing solution is good enough. You know, even if I fix it, what I call fixing it, they're going to look at it and go, well, thousands of programs don't use it. So what's the point of adding this and breaking all this other stuff if nobody uses it? You know, you'd have to understand the bigger picture. And a lot of people are going to have this whole non-invented here. You know, I, I didn't, it wasn't my idea. It's not my baby. So I'm not going to accept it into this open source project. You know, getting people just to accept the repairs to fix the debt. Like if you were in an organization, like a company, you know, doing a piece of software, say you had your company and you offer this big software stack and you want to get them to change this one thing, you, you want to fix the technical debt and you want to say, hey, I'll take this on, I'll do this. You can get the other people that you work with on a fairly regular basis or at least have some sort of, you know, idea how to work with, you can get them on board. Getting open source projects to do something like get rid of technical debt is really, really hard. Uh, egos tend to run big with the kind of people that would program for funsies um, and put it out there to the world. Um, I'm not saying that I'm excluded from that. And they're used to seeing people suggest really dumb ideas offer up really dumb, poor quality patches, 
just it it's just it's a constant. There's just there's always going to be no shortage of people trying to do dumb things with software that the maintainers have to kick off. But if something legitimate like this comes up, I, I have no idea whether they'll accept it or not, but probably not. So if you do all the work and it gets rejected in the end anyway, <laughs> what was the point of doing all the work? Oh, well, I can reap the benefits if I recompile every piece of software for myself and, that, and, and add in the benefit. Okay. Okay, that, that, that went really well. Okay, so now I can use it, which means that all that work is, is multiplied by one. This is the reason I offer my JDupes duplicate scanner work, which is really just a bunch of work on FDupes, which could have just been part of FDupes, but the guy had to be stubborn and ignore me when I was trying to send him patch requests. And I know he ignored me because he demanded that I change the name of my derivative later. So it's not that he couldn't respond, it's that he didn't, he, he refused to say anything to me until he realized that I forked his project and was using a similar name and, and his ego was too big. I don't know. I really don't know. But that's the thing is, you know, it, it, if I have to offer everything up by myself to get the benefits, that sunlight is killing me. Uh, you know, at some point it's just too much for one person. Um, to, you can't beat the rest of the world. And this is a fundamental problem with open source. Um, it is not the panacea that people think it is. Just because software is open source, freely available, just because there may be a lot of things that are superior, doesn't mean that the software is actually superior. Because for software to be, for, for any solution to anything, any solution to be good, well, what's a good solution? That's an incomplete question. Just like how um, I run Linux is not a complete sentence or a complete idea because I run Linux. Well, what, what do you mean Linux? Well, same thing. Is the solution a good solution? Well, in what context? A good solution for what workflow? For what needs? In what environment? Uh, certainly, you'll find that putting Linux Mint on a uh, on a router with eight megs of RAM and 32 megs of flash is probably not going to happen. So Linux Mint, which is the distribution that I recommend people use to get started in the Linux world, Linux Mint is not something that will be good for embedded systems, and it's it's just not going to happen. Like Linux Mint will be trash on a router. It'd be the fattest, bloatiest piece of garbage you ever saw. That's why things like OpenWRT and DDWRT and Yocto exist. Because Linux Mint is a big, fat desktop distribution. It's not for embedded. It's built for different purposes. The way that everything is set up is set up with certain implicit trade-offs. So is the solution good? Eh, you know, maybe maybe it's better for a lot of people if I don't make a fundamental change to all of the underlying APIs that causes breakage in existing systems that don't also have this compatibility shim sort of thing going on. Normally what they would do actually is they'd make a new system call that returns the new values and then internally, you know, they'd have this unified one that just sort of does everything. Anyway, the point is that the technical debt, sometimes people will accept it. Sometimes people just say, you know what, everything works fine. Um, it's okay, it's not as fast as it could be, but it works fine. We don't want to stir the pot. We're worried about the risk. So, yeah, that, and, and that's the problem with it, is that once the debt's there, it, you may never get it out, especially in open source, especially with projects that aren't yours you may never pay that interest off because someone may stop you. And it, there's just, there's so many possibilities here. Anyway, I don't know. Um, I feel kind of bad that I made an 85 minute long rant and posted it and expected people to listen to it too. So uh, this one's at about 20. Um, if you have any more questions about it, let me know. Um, I was hoping that it would be informative, um, but I think 
you know, I went on too long and I'm not going to make the same mistake in this clarification. And I, I'm sorry it was so technical. I know a lot of you aren't programmers and don't have a clue what I'm talking about when I'm talking about structurent, denamlin, reclin, you know, add bytes on 64 bit. Dirt, 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 dirt. It's like, shut up, techno weenie, and get to the point. The point is, I found a better way, but God knows if I'll be able to get that better way hammered into anything else. It'd have to be a personal crusade, and I'd have to be a real pain in everyone's butt to make it happen, and even then, it may not happen. So, all right, I'll close this with one of my favorite sayings, and I don't remember who said it. It might it might have been Bill Gates. I, I can't remember. It might have been Gary Kildall. Who knows? Look it up. Tell me who said this. The greatest enemy of a better solution or a better way is an existing one that's good enough. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that crap. Thanks for watching. Take care.